Hello everybody at Christ Fellowship. Cindy and I are here in sunny Peru, Pucallpa, Peru, where we are complying with the country's regulations to stay at home. We do get out to get some food, money at the bank, medicine if we need it. We've got some Kulina friends here, several families that are stuck in town wanting to get home but no traveling. Uh, so we try to help them. Have to wear a mask when we go out. Some stores require latex gloves. Working at home is nothing new for us because our office is in our house, so we are we spend most of our time there anyway at our computers. What did take a bit of adjustment was not having our house helper come. She had to stay home and quarantine with her family. So we've gotten into a routine, the two of us, that we're doing the, all the cooking and the buying and the cleaning and such, but we're doing fine. When we do get to the office, we've been, we still have the dictionary that we're working on for Kulina with Spanish. We've been sidetracked the last few days with helping one of the Kulina men who is working on some new stories for a school book, working with the Ministry of Education. And he writes, in Kulina we help by translating and putting it on the computer, editing it, then send him questions and try to get answers from him through uh, the phone or WhatsApp, but uh, hopefully we'll be done with that pretty soon. The Kulina, our Kulina friends out in the village call us now and then. Flights have been restricted so no one can get out there, plus the border of, at Brazil is closed and watched so that people won't come up from, river from Brazil. And although that's keeping the people out in the villages safe for now, as soon as flights are established again, the virus will probably get taken out there, so that's a concern for prayer. The two pastors in San Bernardo, named Noba and Awano, both have family members here in Pucallpa, and one of Awano's sons is also in Lima. Their mothers call us from time to time. They're especially concerned about them. They say they've been crying a lot and getting together to pray. The church is meeting together there, so uh, they're praying. Thank you, church family, Christ Fellowship, for your support financially and for your prayers for us. When things here in Peru clear up, the quarantine gets lifted, who knows when, and uh, as travel gets reestablished, we'll, we will be going back to Hollister to help take care of my mom. And so it, we may see you in the summertime, and thankfully it will be summertime, so it won't be a drastic change in climate for us. Yeah. We'll miss our life here, but Hollister has a pretty nice life there too. So, Thank you very much. See you later. Bye-bye. Well, good morning, Christ Fellowship. Welcome to another Sunday. This is your drummer, Stephen Thayard. Hey, I'm standing out front in uh, front of my house, and um, I thought I would greet you again this week. Actually, Rachel asked me to do it, so it's not I thought, but she asked me to do it, so um, here I am. Nonetheless, um, I know we're all still sheltering in place and I miss you all very much. Um, and getting ready for this greeting this morning, I was thinking about all of us have been going through trials in one way or another, dealing with shelter in place. Um, this uh, unseen enemy is, I believe, an attack from uh, the enemy himself. It's almost too perfect in nature. It's got the whole world um, divided and separated and uh, even in differences of opinion on how to approach it. And it has the church not meeting uh, together. So to me, that's an attack, the strategy, an attack from the enemy. Um, and in that face of those trials um, and attacks from the enemy, we're all dealing with it differently. But um, in James, as I was reading, it says for us that are facing these times together, in James 1 uh, verse 2, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So even though we're going through a trial right now, um, it is going to create a steadfastness of faith. Um, there are all, all of us are dealing with it differently. Some of us are really good and doing okay, and some of us are not. If you're doing good, let us know. If you're not doing good, let us know that so that we can bear each other up through this. So uh, 
the prayer this morning is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to read uh, a verse that we're all familiar with, a chapter that we're all familiar with, as our prayer this morning. So if you bow your heads with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. I look forward to seeing all your smiling faces. But remember, we're still the church. Reach out, talk to each other, support each other, bear each other up. Whether you're full of joy and energy and you want to share that with people or you just need a, a, a lift me up or a virtual hug from somebody, reach out. Um, God bless you guys and enjoy the service. Take care. Bye-bye. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory and wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken
riches of this world will fade. The treasure of our God remains. Here I empty myself to all this world, nothing, and find everything in you. The riches of this world. The treasure of our God remains. Here I empty myself to all this world, nothing, and find everything in you. I surrender. Take my life a sacrifice In you alone I'm satisfied Here I empty myself To all this world Nothing And find everything in you Hey everybody, welcome to Christ Fellowship. Here we are again, church by video. I hope you're enjoying it. We're trying to be creative. We're trying to have fun. We're trying to bring a little joy to your life and bring a little hope to your life as we um, get out around in our community. Today I was going to um, be up in San Francisco actually doing this outside at Giant Stadium, uh, but we decided to stay here for a lot of different reasons, mostly time. Uh, but we're looking today at Hebrews chapter 11, which is called the Hall of Faith. Somebody playfully named this chapter sometime in our modern time, uh, the Hall of Faith, because in Hebrews chapter 11, the writer of Hebrews um, refers back to those in their spiritual history who were pillars of faith among them, uh, setting, the, um, setting the tone for things to come in Israel. And so we're going to look at that Hall of Faith today and uh, figure out why these people were elected into the Hall of Faith and what they had in common. But thinking of the Hall of Faith and thinking of April and thinking of all the things that we're missing that are normally happening right now, our hearts turn to baseball. That's right, to baseball. I played a lot of baseball growing up just in the streets of Philadelphia and just playing stickball and whackball and all these different forms of baseball in the streets of Philly. Um, 
but never made it to the Hall of Fame. But I know there's some people that did. We're going to talk about that in a little bit as well. But we're up here at Dunn Park at the um, at the baseball diamond, which it looks like it's open and you're allowed to um, uh, play here. I think. Do we airport? There's a sign up though. Hold on a second. Uh, what is that about? Oh, mountain lion prints we're seeing. Oh, that's no big deal. The mountain lion. Now yeah, we're fine. All right. So we're going to come out here to the baseball diamond just to start off things with a little fun activity. Uh, my wife is out here. What in the world is she doing? Oh, she's here to pitch batting practice. That's right. Did you know that the family that bats together, that does batting practice together, stays together? It's true. And so Christina's going to throw a little batting practice to me. I'm going to put you guys, you're a catcher, so put your masks on, get it? Put your masks on, and you're going to play catcher. There's Christina. She has one outfielder. I think her name's Sherida Hogue. Say hi, Sherida. Hi. There she is. She's out there. She's ready. Christina's going to throw a little of her fastball, her slider, her spitball at me, and let's see if I can hit it, okay? All right. What do you got there, honey? What's that thing? My talcum bag. Oh, talcum bag. All right. You're going to need that talcum bag. All right, here we go. Here we go, ready? Here we go, Sherry. Get ready. Okay. All right. Whoa, I'll take that one with outside for a ball. You got a good eye. Good eye. Good eye, Pastor Mike. Here we go, Christina. Whoa! <laughs> she tried to hit me. She's, it was a brush back. Self-defense right there. All right. Uh, kids, you better might, you might want to leave the room. Here we go. All right. Christina needed a little bit more of a warm-up. That's all right. That's all right. Hey, right there. Just try. Break my phone. Yeah, that was a curveball. No curveballs, honey. Last one right down here. This one's going downtown. There you go for crying. I knew I could do it. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Very good. Wow, that was great. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is why I'm not in the Hall of Fame. Good job, honey. Way to go. Go rest your arm. Good job, Sheridan. Take a lap. Hooray. <laughs> Hooray. Come on in, little girl. All right, we're going to head up here into the dugout since we're sticking with the baseball theme. And uh, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11, the Hall of Faith. What would it be like to be in the Hall of Fame? Hall of Fame people, they pretty much need to be at the top of their game, wouldn't you say? based on talent mostly. I did look at the Hall of Fame website and it does talk about character and they have to be people of integrity, but let's face it, people that are in the Hall of Fame are people that excelled at the game of baseball. They worked hard, they practiced for decades, they played a lot of games, worked out, training, all that kind of stuff to be the best of the best. There's many great baseball players that played in the major leagues that have never made it into the Hall of Fame. And apparently, if you don't make it within the first 10 years, I think, after you've played or something like that, you can't be voted in. So you only have a certain window where you can be voted in. Anyway, we have some great baseball players in our church. A shout out to Jackson and his parents, who basically um, are supporting him in pursuing a career, I think, in, in uh, professional baseball. And uh, shout out to you, Jackson, and your parents. You gotta have supportive parents when you're gonna go on that pursuit. And, and again, that's kind of the, the what that comes, that comes to mind for me when I think of the Hall of Fame is, I think of people that worked really hard, that had a lot of both raw talent and, and developed talent to achieve um, um, uh, milestones in their baseball careers, to throw a certain amount of strikeouts to have a certain amount of wins as a pitcher to hit a certain amount of home runs or have a batting average a lot of it based on performance and as we often learn the things that uh, we use as measures in our earthly life secular life are not necessarily the things that uh, God looks at and uses to measure success in in the kingdom and so when we look at the hall of faith today when this writer of hebrews who has given us a great portrait of who jesus is was as 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 a high priest come to earth and is now in heaven in in as he ministers next to the father at the right hand of the father uh he turns to uh this heritage of theirs and says be encouraged stick with the faith be like your forefathers who live their lives by faith and we're going to talk about what faith is today because it's so important have a sound definition of faith and then uh, talk a little bit about um, some of these people but before we do that let me pray and ask the Lord for his help Lord as we open your word today help us to um, open our hearts 
uh, to you, to know who you are, to receive from you knowledge and wisdom and encouragement for these days. These are days where we need a lot of faith. We need to press into who, not who we are, but who you are. And uh, Lord, we ask that you would help us do that today as, uh, as we listen to your word, as we fellowship together. Even, even though we're physically apart, we're united in spirit and united by your Holy Spirit. And we thank you for that. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So in a moment here, I'm just going to read part of uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 11, the Hall of Faith. And what I want you to do, though, before I start reading, is I want you to just discuss among yourselves, have a little discussion group, as to who do you think is in the Hall of Faith in the book of Hebrews. I'm going to give you a hint. Old Testament people, New Testament wasn't out yet, wasn't printed yet. Um, so Old Testament people that the writer of Hebrews is going to be led to refer to. Who do you think is in the Hall of Faith? Discuss among yourselves. Go ahead. We need some music here, right here. There's a lot of them. There's, there's probably close to 20 that he mentioned. Some are going to be like, oh yeah, of course. And others are going to be like, what? Are you serious? And so we're going to begin by reading uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and see if uh, some of the names that you thought of um, popped up. Okay, Hebrews chapter 11. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to kind of read a part of it. And then I'll tell you who the rest of the names are. And then I'll read the concluding part. Okay, because I don't want to lose you. But it starts this way with the great definition of um, faith that has often been referred to. It starts this way. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for, sure of what we long for, and certain of what we do not see. I saw a funny video this week where somebody was saying how they couldn't help think about how God, people do not believe in God because they can't see him, uh, but they're um, learning all about this coronavirus, which you can't see yet they believe in that. We believe in a lot of things that aren't seen. Why is it so hard to believe in a God who is quote unquote not seen? This is what the ancients were commended for, for their faith, being certain of what they had not seen. For it was by faith that we understand that the universe was formed by God at his command, so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible, but is what, what is invisible. It was by faith that Abel, did you put Abel in your hall of faith? Abel, Cain's brother, offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That's a great verse, Hebrews 4, 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. What does it mean to believe? What does it mean to have faith? Verse 7, by faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. And he saved all humanity, quite honestly. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he, he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and he went, even though he did not know where he was going. That makes all you men in the family feel good about driving somewhere you don't know where you're going. That was exactly what Abraham was doing. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents even though he was wealthy, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with the foundation whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise that he would have many descendants. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. And then in summary, verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. 
They did not receive all the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, and they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have returned. Instead, they were longing for a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to call them their to call their to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. I'm going to talk about um, a Abel and um, Noah and Abraham and Enoch here in a second. But some of the other people that the writer goes on to mention are Isaac and Jacob, who had previously been mentioned, Joseph um, for his role in, in uh, calling out the Israelites um, and talking about the Exodus to come, uh, Moses, and Moses' parents are named. Moses' parents who saw him as a child with an anointing, a special um, calling on his life, hid him from danger because they knew there was something unique about him. Moses, who could have stayed in Egypt and lived in the palace the rest of his life, but instead joined his, his brethren, his ancestors, as a fellow slave to lead them out of the, um, out of the nation of Egypt. Uh, the people of Israel themselves are in the, in the hall of faith. People who walked through the Red Sea by faith, that would have been a little bit scary. Uh, Joshua is named, although he's, not, he's actually not named, the walls of Jericho are named. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell, and we know Joshua um, was the one who was there. And uh, by faith, the prostitute Rahab um, is named as well. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samson, and all the prophets. They're all named um, in the Hall of Faith because they were people that um, pursued um, what was good and what was right based uh, not on the possibilities before them, not on the opportunities, not on the talents that they possess, not on their heritage or their wealth. They pursued things in life uh, based on their knowledge and their belief in God and who God was. And that's what we want to talk about today. So let's talk about some of those first few people. Let's just pretend we're building a lineup. I got my little lineup here, my roster. There's my roster of, of if I were to play the, the, the it's called the Israel Old Timers team. Um, if I were to put them in a batting order, um, Abel would be um, batting first because he's named first. And he presented a, he and his brother Cain presented the first offerings to God as a gift of love, as a gift of recognition of God's faithfulness to them. And Abel presented the better sacrifice. He presented a calf or, or a part of a livestock, a firstborn of his livestock, something that couldn't be replaced, something that wasn't going to grow back, something that was going to cost him. He offers the first animal sacrifice to the Lord, and the Lord calls it a righteous sacrifice. And I can't help to think it's because Abel is offering something of great value to him that he doesn't know is going to be replaced. When you give a firstborn of a litter of your livestock, you don't know what the other litters of your livestock are going to be. And they're people that lived um, animal to animal sometimes and, and were very much on their own. And, but he offers this animal as a blood sacrifice, kind of modeling the sacrifices that God would command his people to give. So close to what the law would require, yet the law was still hundreds of years off. And God recognized it as a righteous um, sacrifice. And, and Cain got jealous because of God's words to Abel. And as we know, um, Cain killed Abel, which I said a few weeks back, I, saw, I said Cain killed Abel with the leg of a table. That's what I was taught when I was a kid to remember who killed who. And everybody looked at me like, what in the world are you talking about? No one else had ever heard that. But if you always want to remember, did Cain kill Abel? Did Abel kill Cain? Cain killed Abel with the leg of a table, but I don't think it was the leg of a table. Anyway, second one, second person, Enoch. Enoch is a descendant of Seth. There were multiple Enochs in the Bible, but Enoch is a descendant of Seth, and he's named in Genesis chapter 5, where all of the descendants of Seth, which was Adam and Adam and Eve's last son that's named, is their third son. Um, Enoch is mentioned as one of the descendants, and he's marked off uh, unique as all the other descendants of Seth, because it doesn't say how long he lived, like the other descendants are described. It doesn't say when he died, like the other descendants are described. It says how long he walked with the Lord. And in fact, it goes on to say that, not that he died, but that the Lord took him at a young age. There's this, there's this setting apart of, um, of, of um, Enoch uh, that marks him as a righteous man who walked in relationship with God. The things that he pursued in life were to be in the presence of God. And it's, it's a very simple passage. There's not a lot that's said about him, but he's obviously marked off as someone 
who was a righteous man to balance out the unrighteousness that was a part of, um, of humanity, even at that early stage. Then there's Noah. Noah, who at age 600 built an ark because God told him to. Would you build an ark if God told you to build an ark? Even if all your aunts, even if all your neighbors were looking at you like you're crazy. Good thing for Noah, you know, to build an ark at 600 years old, that had to be a challenge. But good thing for him, he had three young sons um, that were all uh, around 100 years old. And so they were able to help with the heavy lifting. Noah, despite what people were thinking, despite that there weren't even rain clouds in the sky, there was no sign that a flood was coming according to the scriptures. And uh, yet he hears this, this command from God to build an ark to save not only his family, but literally to restart humanity. And Noah, by faith, um, follows God's command. And we know that Noah wasn't a perfect man. We see a scene in the later life where he's drunk and laying on the ground naked. And he wasn't somebody who <laughs> modeled, I know, shared a scary. He wasn't somebody who modeled perfection by any means. But he listened to the voice of God. He knew God. He knew God was dependable and faithful and good. And so he followed his voice by faith. Abraham's the last one to name. He's kind of a franchise player. If, if, if in that discussion where I was asking you to try to name people from the Old Testament that would be in the Hall of Faith and you did not name Abraham, well, shame on you. Abraham would be probably like the franchise player that he would be a, a, a member of the team for life. He faced so many things. Yet by faith, he pursued and followed God's um, promises that he would be the father of many people and that he would be uh, one who would lead the people into a land of their own. So many obstacles. He was captured and, and, and threatened by Egyptian leaders. He faced famine. He went from a, 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 from a homeland where he was rich. He had many possessions, so he had to be living in luxury. He goes to a land that's filled with enemies and lives in a tent. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. And again, Abraham, not, a, not a, uh, a perfect person. He lived in fear at times. When he went into lands where they, he thought they would kill him because his wife was so beautiful, he said his wife was his sister, which she was, actually. She was his half-sister, but still. He was a man that struggled with fear, uh, yet he's a man that kept going forward, following uh, the calling God had on his life. Um, following after uh, pursuing with passion the promises God had made for him uh, to him about being the father of many people and and uh, and the one who would lead them into a land that would be called their own even though it seemed highly unlikely uh, Abraham went forward because he believed in God he had met God he had spent time with God and knew God to be um, faithful and good and true and so those are just a couple examples you can look in your own scriptures to figure out why these other people are in the hall of faith. But as I looked at it and studied it and thought about it and prayed about it, I thought the common denominator obviously has to be, it's kind of staring us in the face. It is faith, but it is faith uh, to trust God based on who they knew him to be, based on God's character. They went forward in life, not based on practicality, what we would call, not based on their own resources. They went forward on life based on who God was, not on who they were. Think about that for this time right now. Here we are in the midst of a pandemic. Nobody knows what's, when it's gonna end. Nobody knows what the cure is, whether there's gonna be a vaccine. Some people argue that it's serious. Other people argue that it's not that serious. We're talking about starting the economy. People are losing their businesses. There, there's so many unknowns. That's why we want you to come down to the church and be praying once a week, right? There's so many unknowns. It just feels like we stand on civilization at a very fragile time. So how are you gonna go forward? Are you gonna go forward based on how many rolls of toilet paper you have? Are you gonna go forward based on how much canned food you have or how resourceful you are or how healthy you are? Or are you gonna go forward based on who God is and what God has promised for you, who God has shown himself to be in your life in the past? Who, who the word says God is in terms of both beginnings and end. God, the Alpha and the Omega. God who said his kingdom is going to come. God who said that humanity and, and creation will be, the grand crescendo will be when Jesus returns. Are you going forward on the knowledge of those things? Or are you going forward based on the things that will keep you safe and your own ability to survive? Do you see what I'm saying? There's an aspect of, of, of being a part of God's kingdom and being a son and daughter of God where you're to go forward based on um, a, a life of surrender. It sounds crazy, but it's true. A life of surrender, a life of trust, a life of belief, not in ourselves, but in belief in God.
I wanted to share with you, I grabbed my notes here for a second, I wanted to share just two pointers about what faith is. Because I think sometimes we just get confused about what faith is. We, we're asked for a definition of faith and that, that definition comes that it's, you know, being sure of things um, hoped for and certain of things that are unseen. And that's a great definition. But, but it's still, I don't know, it's still kind of wrestle with it. I need something more simple than that. And to me, um, faith has just been uh, a, a, an act of surrender, a, a, an act of trust in the goodness of God. And, and here's something that, that I need to remind myself constantly that I, I've come to a place of faith in God through Jesus Christ that is not a, a coming of my own. God has unexplainably led me to a place of trusting Him. It's not that I trust Him every day. It's not that, that, I, that I'm not fearful. It's not that I don't have doubts and, and wonder about the future in, in some regards. But underlying all that, even during this pandemic time, I have sensed in myself, and I'm not bragging, I'm just saying, and I'm not bragging because it's from, I know it's from God. I have just sensed a, a, a sense of every, I, everything's going to be all right. As if God is saying, I got this. I don't have this. God has it, and as a son and daughter of God, I can take comfort in the fact that my God, my Father, has this. I wish we all could think back to times when we were children where we, we had those uncertain moments where we were, became fearful or we were uncertain of what the future held or even what was going on all around us. And we looked to our parents and we saw like the calm face of our parents that everything was okay. And then all of a sudden as a child, you get the sense of, oh, I guess it's gonna be okay because daddy and mommy are okay. That's, that's the way we need to approach this pandemic time, that we may feel a, a sense of panic in us. We may, there might be uncertainty. We don't know what to do. Well, look to your Father. Look to your Heavenly Father and ask yourself, what is He thinking? What is He doing? Is God panicking right now? No, God's allowing His purposes to be fulfilled. In fact, we're hearing good things happening in people's lives. Spiritual breakthroughs. Uh, some people are, the crisis is bringing to, to them to terms with with ongoing crises that have been a part of their life that they're finally beginning to deal with because it's kind of all coming to a head. Uh, we're seeing God heal things. We're seeing God do breakthroughs in, in, uh, in medicine and in, in our preparation and, uh, and our, 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 even our understanding of our limits uh, of humanity, the limits of our preparedness and the limits of, of things we can provide answers for. And coming to terms with our limits is honestly a good thing because it forces us to ask the next question, that is, what am I to do? And, and what you're to do, I believe, what I'm to do, is to trust in God, the God who has no limits. Um, so, the two things about faith that I've kind of lost, but I want to bring back. One, first of all, faith is not about accomplishments. It's not like about uh, being a Hall of Famer, where we work hard to, to muster up great faith and show it to people. It's not like I can go to spiritual boot camp and get more faith. Faith is not an accomplishment, um, it's a gift. It's a gift from God that he imparts to you. There's scriptures that point towards that. When Jesus was talking to his disciples and they were kind of fretting because he was getting ready to leave them, he comforted them by saying, the Holy Spirit is gonna come to you. You don't have to figure it out. The Holy Spirit's gonna come to you and provide for you what you need. Wisdom, power, knowledge, leading, promptings in your spirit so you'll know what to do. Everything that the son and daughter of God needs to do, everyone who's a part of God's kingdom is going to be supplied by God in order to live in that kingdom. So, so that's true about faith as well. There's a scripture in, in Ephesians chapter 2. Let's see if I can quote it. It's Ephesians 2, 9 that says, um, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith which is a gift from God. It is by God's, it is by means of God's grace that you've been saved. You didn't earn it, he gave it to you as a gift. And how did you realize that gift? How did you partake of that gift? You partook of it, you realized it by faith. You took it by faith, which itself was a gift of God. I'm certain faith is a gift from God because it's listed in the, in the fruits of the Spirit. When, we, when Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 5, he, he talked about the attributes of the characteristics of a person who follows God and is filled with His Spirit. And one of those attributes is oftentimes um, uh, uh, interpreted faithfulness. But if you look at the Greek, it's not faithfulness really, it's really not the best word. It's faith. It's the gift of faith. 
pistis in the Greek is what it is. Faithfulness such as dependability or reliability. That's a whole nother Greek word. It's a whole nother Greek word with another ending. But this is a word for faith. You're gifted with joy. You're gifted with love. You're gifted with faith. So you don't have to muster it up. You don't have to ask yourself what's wrong with you. <laughs> if there's anything wrong with you, it's because you haven't asked God for the gift of faith. So if you're feeling like you need that extra measure of believing what's not seen, that extra measure of being able to lean into God and trust in His goodness, not in your knowledge or savvy. If you feel like you need that extra measure of just throwing yourselves in the arms of God and you just don't have the knowledge or the where for all to know how to do it, here's how you do it. You ask God for the gift, the power to do it. He wants to give it to you because that's the life, that's the posture He wants you to have um, with Him. And so, can you ask Him today for the gift of faith? Gift of greater faith? Would you ask him to pour faith into your life? Can I pray for that for you and for our whole church right now during this season? Father, would you just give us the gift of faith? Would you pour into us an unexplainable, supernatural ability to rest in your arms, to trust you for everything we need, to trust you for breakthroughs in our culture and society, to trust you for leading our political leaders and medical leaders, to trust you to manage this illness that we're dealing with, to trust you with the future that is unknown, to trust you with the economy, our own finances, our own family members, to lay all those things as yours, to trust you as our Abba, Father, Daddy. Would you give us that faith, that trust, to be able to live that life? Because we know you want that for us. You, you said you give us peace, not as the world gives, you give it from yourself. And so Lord, give your people, give your children today peace. Uh, and assurance and, and certainty um, but through the gift of faith, Father. Impart faith into your people today, Lord. And teach us. Teach us how to um, devoid ourselves of thinking that, um, that we have to provide all the answers or we have to be the ones to, quote unquote, survive. Help us to survive in you, to sur survive in you, your arms. Help us to allow you to carry us through these days and all days ahead, Lord. We love you and we thank you we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So many more things I could say. Look at this chapter, chapter 11. It's an awesome chapter. Read it some more and then go out and do some batting practice. Uh, and then pray for one another, care for one another, listen for the small, the still small voice of our Lord, prompting you to reach out to one another and, and, um, and care for one another. And, and lastly, think of an hour, an hour time slot. It doesn't have to be an hour that you come down, but an hour time slot where you'll say, yes, 8 to 9 a.m. Wednesday morning, I'll come down. The sanctuary will be open during the work hours, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. The prayer room is always open. The campus is always open. Um, come down and lift up your hearts to the Lord and intercede for our nation that needs prayer warriors. There's a lot of great leaders in our nation, but they don't know how to pray, but you do. Come down and pray for those that don't know how to pray. Call on the Lord uh, to bring healing and wholeness and, and salvation to our land. We love you. Good to see you. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday. Thanks, Rachel and, and team for the music, Stephen. And thank you, Debbie, for all the great work you do um, on these videos. God bless you.